Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Ronnie Michelle, who is going to be speaking to us today about the impact of psychosocial and behavioral changes related to the modern day flexible office setting. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. Um, my research actually fits in really well with uh, what Melissa and Dwayne were just talking about as well. Um, so, um, trying to see the different changes that have happened over the few uh, over the last few years, and uh, even just seeing a lot of those trends being accelerated through COVID. Um, so that's kind of what I'll get into. Um, so. Um, the topic of my talk today is investigating the impact of physical, psychosocial, and behavioral changes uh, related to modern and flexible office settings. So, um, yeah, so I can just dive right uh, into it. Um, so, just to give you a quick background on myself, um, so I graduated in 2017 from McMaster uh, with my Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology. And in uh, 2019, I finished up my master's of human kinetics, uh, specifically specializing in ergonomics at the University of Windsor. Um, so, uh, for my master's, I assessed physical and psychosocial risk factors associated with changes to modern offices. And that was done in partnership with a company called My Ability Technologies, uh, which is currently based in Mississauga, Ontario, and a hospital network, uh, Hamilton Health Sciences, where we were uh, working with our office workers there. So, in general, with all uh, types of ergonomics, we do have four major factors to consider uh, when looking at potential risk uh, for injury. So, uh, specifically posture, uh, so how the person is working and uh, the different postures they're adopting as they're working. Uh, duration, so how long they're doing a given task or tasks over a whole day. Uh, repetition, how frequently they're doing the same task uh, over and over, the same repetitive movements. And force, uh, so uh, how heavy or uh, how much force is exerted uh, during a task. Um, but with office ergonomics, uh, naturally with forces, they're generally going to be a lot lower, so they're not as big of a concern compared to something like working uh, in an industrial job or working construction or uh, anything like that. So uh, the three major factors we really look at the most are posture, duration, and repetition. Um, so the posture people are working, so their office setup, uh, duration, how long they're working doing given tasks or staying in the same postures, um, and repetition, uh, just the repetitive movements of typing, mousing, uh, all of those things. So, for my research, um, it was specifically, like I said, uh, office ergonomics, and luckily it was all done in 2019. So, this is all pre COVID. Uh, so, really, the last time that this kind of research could have been done in the last few years, uh, where we're actually going into an office uh, uh, environment and watching workers and assessing them. Um, but uh, as the world is starting to look to reopen in the near to distant future, uh, depending on where you live, uh, there's a lot of application, I think, that can help guide how to best support workers through ergonomics on the other side of this thing. Um, but there's also some things that we can take from it uh, when applying it to working from home and uh, the different flexible options that uh, have arisen. So, uh, this presentation is hopefully just going to give you some digestible bits that you can apply uh, to your own situation, whether you're a manager or worker. Uh, just really an, an ergonomist, just anyone kind of in that space uh, looking to improve their office setup. Um, so, um, so yeah, so both of these studies here, uh, they're actually in the process of getting reviewed, but are intended to be published sometime uh, this year. So, uh, for anyone interested, that should be something to look forward to uh, in the near future as well. Um, so, uh, so, our first study uh, was investigating the impact of changes of modern offices, uh, the rapid office strain of sight. And we say 10 years later here, uh, that's just because the original assessment was made 10 years ago. Uh, so we're kind of using that as a baseline from 10 years ago and seeing the office trends at the time and comparing it to now and seeing those changes uh, using the same assessment tool. So um, as Dwayne and uh, uh, Dwayne mentioned earlier, uh, musculoskeletal disorders uh, or RSI, so those terms can sometimes be interchangeable, but um, they are a significant issue for employees and employers. 
Um, so in Canada specifically, it is deemed the most costly medical condition. Um, so the direct and indirect costs uh, have been estimated to be around 22 billion a year. And uh, that number is even higher in the US. So uh, in the US, it's about 980 billion. Um, so, uh, so we know that it is a significant problem uh, anyways. And uh, as uh, Dwayne mentioned earlier as well, um, we're seeing these shifts already that were happening before COVID where more work was um, shifting towards com using computers and working in an office. So, um, so this was a projection in 2012, but um, at the time in 2012, more than 50% of jobs were requiring some degree of computer proficiency. And they projected at that time for the year 2020 for that number to be 77%. Um, so naturally due to the effects of COVID and remote work increasing, that number has only increased uh, uh, exponentially uh, really over the last couple of years. So, um, and then further, uh, in the future of job report of 2018, uh, there is already a, sh a projected shift of 42% uh, in core workforce skills that required the use of uh, technology or automation. So uh, basically jobs that did not have computers as a key component uh, of their work-related tasks were expected to incorporate them by 2022. And again, these, are, these were projections pre-COVID uh, and those numbers are expected to be even higher now. Um, so progress in the field of ergonomics uh, should have a more wide in widespread impact in the future uh, as a result of the rising number of jobs that are moving towards a greater dependence on computers. So um, yeah, so th these things as time will go on, uh, it is expected that they will uh, impact more and more people. So uh, it is important that uh, we learn as much as we can about it and, and try to apply it as uh, efficiently as we can. Um, so just to give you a background on ROSA, just because that was the tool we were using to compare the changes. Um, so uh, ROSA is a picture-based office ergonomics screening tool, and it informs users of areas of risk uh, in their layout. Um, so uh, it was first published in 2010, but the project, uh, that and the process of it being developed started in 2008. Uh, and uh, as uh, Melissa mentioned with the new guidelines for office ergonomics uh, that they're implementing. Uh, so those were based on 2017 uh, and, and they're making no, new guidelines with CSA standards. Um, but for the original ROSA tool, it was based on the standards from 2000. So 21 years ago. Um, so. CSA guidelines, uh, essentially, they give qualitative suggestions for office work. Um, so when you're thinking about it, all of the, I guess, office ergonomic cliches, I guess, of, you know, having your monitor a certain height or your keyboard at elbow height, um, all, all of those things, but those are qualitative in nature and their suggestions. So um, Rosa essentially took those qualitative uh, guidelines and made them uh, quantitative. Uh, so, uh, applying quantitative uh, numbers to those things in order to actually measure how much risk was associated with it. Um, so, naturally, there are certain postures or there are certain alignments that may be more risky than others. Uh, so, it was working to uh, establish those uh, qual uh, quantitative uh, guidelines for that. Um, so, this was done through using a discomfort questionnaire and establishing relationships between localized discomfort uh, with the ROSA scores based on the setup of a person's work environment and the durations uh, that a person was working in that environment. So um, after development, uh, ROSA has been validated by a number of papers uh, as a means of analyzing postural risks uh, for workers in, office, uh, in offices. And um, while it also informs workers and employers uh, of potential modifications that can be implemented uh, to further reduce the risk of MSDs. Uh, so it's not just that it'll tell you how bad a workstation may be or tell you this is the level of risk you have, but it's also meant to help you actually uh, have tangible changes that you can make. So uh, it, it'll let you know the adjustment adjustments you may need to make about your chair, uh, your keyboard, whatever it is. So specifically the things that Rosa covers uh, our workstations that can, uh, 
that contain all of these uh, five things here. Um, so uh, when it was first developed, uh, again, 2008 to 2010, it was made to uh, include these components because that's what the offices at the time uh, were commonly composed of. Um, so uh, each of these components has their own uh, scoring criteria and it depends on uh, the configurations to calculate a risk score for each of these uh, five components. Um, so uh, if a person had to reach across a desk, for example, to grab a phone, uh, that would result in a higher area score. So uh, just to give you an example of what that actually looks like. Um, so this is just an example of uh, one of the scoring charts. So uh, this would be the original ROSA where um, you would have to circle or select uh, the specific alignment that correlates to your actual uh, environment. So you could look at a person working and you can just select the options uh, accordingly and their scoring related to duration as well there. Um, and once you add up that whole score, you'll get a com uh, you'll get an actual section score for that area. Um, and the actual discomfort questionnaire used uh, in order to create those relationships between uh, the guidelines and figuring out risk uh, was the Cornell University discomfort questionnaire. So uh, this is just what it looks like. So you would focus on uh, every single one of those bodily regions or segments. Um, so I believe there's 13 in total. Um, but uh, so you would get a discomfort score based on the frequency that a person felt discomfort, the intensity of their discomfort, and how much that discomfort impacted them on a daily basis or how frequently. So um, getting those scores and comparing it to the alignments uh, was helpful in giving you actual risks, uh, overall risk scores for each thing. So, um, what you would do is you would take those section scores that I mentioned earlier, and you would put them into these matrices and they would give you a risk score that once you work your way all the way down, you would get an overall grand score. Um, so the green area means that you have a great, uh, work environment. Uh, that there's very low risk. Yellow is kind of that cautionary area where changes should uh, could be made um, and, and that there is a level of risk that you could make minor adjustments. And then the red area means that immediate adjustments need to be made. So uh, luckily, you don't have to fill out these sheets anymore. Um, there are alternatives instead of just going in and printing out a bunch of paper and, and going through these matrices. Um, so these, these are mainly, uh, in the original study, and this was what was used before. Um, there is an online version of ROSA that's a lot more user friendly. That is on OCAL's website, uh, where you can do, uh, individual assessments. So, uh, there is a link to that at the end of the presentation and, uh, in the handout, if you do, uh, uh download that later as well. But, um, so th there is an online version there and for company wide management. Uh, and for the updated version with all of the different iterations, uh, you can go to My Abilities Technologies, uh, where the original developer of ROSA, uh, Dr. Michael Son, uh, he's the VP of research there. And the link for that as well is at the end of the presentation. But uh, luckily you don't have to do this every single time and, and go through the matrices anymore. Uh, those things have been implemented into different online applications um, to make it a lot more easier. But, uh, so again, thinking back to when this was first developed uh, in 2008 or 2010, um, Dwayne and Melissa touched on it a little bit about some of the changes that we've seen since then. Uh, so some of the big changes, uh, specifically smartphones, tablets, laptops, dual monitors, uh, and sit stand desks uh, ha have been uh, emerging. So specifically smartphones, uh, I believe the iPhone came out in 2008. Um, so that was something that was completely new and, and wasn't really something considered, um, and tablets as well that, that came out after the fact. So, um, but laptops, dual monitors and sit stand desks, even though they were there before, uh, they've become more commonly used in office settings, uh, and they've just become more naturally, uh, implemented into it, uh, across the board. So, whereas before they may have been for specific niche jobs. Uh, they're becoming more and more free, uh, frequent and commonly used uh, across uh, different industries, still in office work. And uh, again, uh, the increase in remote work and flexibility. So 
having work accessible away from the office. Uh, so again, with laptops, uh, cell phones, uh, so you're always connected away from work uh, and work just becoming paperless as well. Uh, so not having the same need to carry around binders or uh, having a lot of paper documents uh, like before. So uh, in the past, you may have a document holder that was beside your monitor uh, if you're trying to transcribe something. But now uh, a lot of that kind of thing uh, could have been replaced through using like a dual monitor, uh, for example, or um, something like that. So uh, there, there has been a shift away from that and more methods of communication uh, as well. So video conferencing, so things like this. Um, and uh, instant messaging clients, so uh, applications like Slack uh, or, or different uh, types of messaging um, outside of that. So these are already things that were happening at the time of our study, um, but those things have picked up even more. So it kind of lends itself to having a, a bit more relevance, uh, which is uh, interesting. But um, so the things that weren't directly assessed by Rosa that we wanted to really focus on uh, were dual monitors, uh, laptops. So specifically with laptops, uh, looking at the fixed nature of them. So with the laptop, uh, you have a fixed monitor, fixed keyboard and fixed mouse. Um, so not having that flexibility and having things kind of, uh, forcibly in place, it kind of limits, uh, uh, the different ways that they can be arranged. And, um, because they're fixed as well, they can often have issues uh, lead to issues around posture just because uh, if you have your laptop at eye level that usually means that your keyboard is too high and then you're typing at a poor posture uh, if your keyboard is at wrist height or at a elbow height uh, then usually that means that your monitor is too low and, and then you're using your neck too much uh, to look down but uh, so it has unique components with that um, cell phones again um, back to that time it, the majority of phone use in, in offices was just your, your desk phone. So, um, yeah, so seeing changes with that and sit stand desks as well. So, um, we didn't specifically include tablets here. Um, so specifically with our, uh, testing sample, uh, tablets were rarely used and they weren't administered at that organization we were working with. Um, and they were not, and when they were used, they weren't the primary. Uh, working device uh, while uh, every other technology was, um, but uh, in the case of cell phones, when they were used as a prime, uh, weren't used as a primary device either, but they often would substitute directly for a desk phone uh, in a lot of cases. So um, those are just the ones that could fit the most clearly with Rosa. So those were the ones we wanted to really investigate. Um, so uh, the research for this project, we had three primary goals. Uh, so we want to better understand current trends in offices and worker behaviors at the time of our study. Uh, we wanted to see if there were significant changes or trends compared to how the office environments at the time of the uh, original studies, uh, which was about 10 years ago. Um, yeah, see, see if there are any changes between now and that time 10 years ago uh, and based on any changes or trends, see if any alterations were needed uh, to be applied onto Rosa. Um, so for our methods, uh, so essentially we, we kind of just redid the original studies that were done 10 years ago. Uh, so we try to keep the methods as close to them as possible to see if we could directly uh, compare trends and, and changes in offices. So uh, we had a similar sample size. We used a similar partner organization and the industry uh, was the same. So the same types of work was being done uh, by those office workers uh, and we used the same questionnaires. So. Uh, we recruited 57 office workers and they were mainly working in cubicles uh, from, yeah, so from a similar organization as the original studies. Uh, and our inclusion criteria was just that they spent at least 50% uh, of their work day on a computer and that they used at least one of the technologies of interest uh, while not having a musculoskeletal disorder in the past year, uh, just to, uh, yeah, just to control for that as well. If people were already injured um, uh, or had chronic injuries before or, or acute injuries before. So uh, we just wanted to make sure that there weren't any uh, anything in there that, that could skew it a little bit. But um, so, uh, yeah, we, we gave them two questionnaires. 
and we gave them an in-person assessment that was conducted at their own workstations using ROSA. Um, and from that, we got uh, quite a few key insights from that. So this is uh, kind of where we're shifting to kind of what does this mean for everyone else? Um, so uh, as far as changes we saw between this study and the past study, we did see less overall phone use and better postures adopted, uh, while dual monitor use uh, uh, was negatively impacting uh, monitor scores. So uh, desk phones, again, were not used as regularly as in the original study. Um, and when they were used, uh, neutral postures were common through using either a headset or headphones with a microphone or through using alternative methods of communication. So um, whether, whether it was using just instant messaging uh, or emails or shifting more to online communication, um, those things often uh, moved people away from actually using desk phones as frequently. Um, so uh, the durations were significantly lower. Uh, and the postures were better, which was fantastic. But um, and the presence of dual monitors resulted in greater levels of neck twisting. So that was primarily what was behind having worse monitor scores and how that would impact your overall injury risk. Um, so in the original study, uh, single monitors were primarily used. So it was a good direct comparison to see uh, what that practically looks like for uh, when you're comparing single monitor to dual monitor use and kind of seeing the, uh, the direct changes with that. But um, so we, we also saw that uh, overall the risk scores were much lower in modern offices today compared to the ones before. And that was primarily due to offices becoming more flexible uh, through using laptops, extend desks and cell phones um, instead of just using your uh, office phone. So. Um, it allowed workers to limit the duration that they may be exposed to harmful risks uh, or harmful postures um, in their individual setups. So essentially just uh, when you're working in multiple setups, you're breaking up the amount of time you're in each individual setup. So you're directly impacting your durations. Uh, so even if you are in a harmful setup, um, you wouldn't be in it for as long if you were in other, uh, if you were able to break it up and move to a different set up or posture. Um, now, th that doesn't mean just uh, work in as many places as possible, regardless of, of the setup, but um, at, at the least, uh, even if they weren't optimally uh, set up, there was a slight benefit to being uh, in multiple setups, but it's still recommended that you would adjust things uh, with um, accordingly uh, to make sure that people were in optimum setups and in, in each one that they're in. But uh, so that, that was just interesting. Um, and we found that regardless uh, of the differences in the actual office workers, so regardless of their heights, weights, uh, what their uh, gender was, anything like that, um, regardless of the actual make of their laptop as well, um, the laptops yielded consistent scores across the board. And again, that was just mainly due to how uh, their fixed nature. Uh, so having that fixed monitor, keyboard and mouse, uh, there wasn't as much variability in how they were set up compared to a standard desktop. Um, so we had less extremes because of that. Uh, so regardless of if you had like a 13-inch monitor or 13-inch laptop or 18-inch laptop, uh, typically you would find the same general postures. Uh, they weren't too different uh, compared to when you have people using all different types of monitors and separate keyboards and separate mice. Um, keyboards just had more consistent uh, layout scores. Um, so uh, sit-stand desk uh, users, they also had significantly uh, reduced the amount of time spitting across, or sitting uh, across their whole day, um, hopefully spitting as well. But uh, even with the use of them, uh, uh, like, uh, so with, with the sit-stand usage, uh, it was mainly self-guided. So. Um, they could choose when they wanted to sit or stand. It wasn't anything imposed on them, and we're just seeing their own typical behavior that they would use it. Um, so uh, that was still uh, functional enough and, and useful enough that we did see significantly reduced sitting durations uh, across the typical workday. But um, so there was that. And in, in general, our new components that we studied were mostly easily integrated. Um, so uh, considerations for more specific. Uh, phone scoring uh, 
so including cell phone and texting considerations, uh, defined parameters for stand uh, sit stand use, uh, and uh, potentially incorporating the effect of using uh, an anti fatigue mat, for example. Uh, those were all proposed as potential ways uh, to improve Rosa and just make it a, a bit more robust. Uh, but it, all of those things were uh, fairly easy to implement and, and those are the things that would be implemented if you were to go through uh, my abilities to use Rosa. Um, so, um, so taking all of those insights into mind, what the application of all that is. Uh, so when we're replacing standard desk phones or adopting hands-free options, uh, again, those were a great trend um, and they uh, really the best way you can deal with those risks uh, of postures and, and everything like that is if you can just remove them altogether. So uh, in particular, when you have those hand-free options, you may not have to reach across your desk uh, to grab your phone. You, you wouldn't have to hold it up to your ear for a long time. Um, so those concerns specifically with the upper extremity and the shoulders um, and, and whatever lower back, uh, any sort of torso or twisting, anything like that, if you can completely remove that risk factor, uh, then that, that's always going to be the most ideal uh, path uh, with that. So uh, specifically using those different hands-free options or different ways of communicating, those were a great trend and, and something that is recommended. Um, so uh, when using a dual monitor, uh, we do believe it is important to weigh the risks and benefits of using a dual monitor. So uh, for the most part, incorporating dual monitors does add a level of discomfort through neck twisting uh, and uh, for most of the research it is a little inconclusive on uh, the effectiveness it has on worker productivity so it often depends on the actual type of work being done uh, and personal preferences so uh, for certain jobs it's definitely more helpful to use a dual monitor but um, if you don't need to add one then working with the single monitor is going to help limit those different postural concerns. Um, so there all are there are alternatives as well to help with multitasking. So whether using hotkeys or keyboard shortcuts, uh, things like that can can also help you if you want to navigate through a lot of windows differently. And you can still do that with a single monitor. So um, really just weighing the benefits and risks of it. If it's absolutely essential for a job and um, it, it for that specific job, it would increase productivity or efficiency, then um, you would just have to weigh those things. But uh, if not, uh, single monitor is always um, is going to at least help you remove or, or reduce the amount of neck twisting that would be present. Um, so, and, and again, so uh, what I was uh, mentioning earlier with varying your setups. Um, so, again, just you're breaking up the amount of time you're staying in one posture for a long time. Um, and that can help with circulation, but uh, again, consideration should definitely be made to ensure that every single setup you're in uh, is properly adjusted, uh, at least. So uh, you don't, ideally you're not moving from one bad posture to another bad posture to another bad posture, because uh, even if you are breaking that up, you are still gonna have some detrimental effects from being in those poor postures. So. Um, but uh, another thing too is just uh, just in general and thinking about office ergonomics. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, most of office ergonomics, the benefits of it are going to be around reducing your risks and trying to remove barriers to have people working at their peak performance or peak potential. Uh, but it doesn't actually make someone more physically fit by working an office job. Uh, so. All of these changes that we have, whether it's sit stand desks or uh, going up for a walk for like a minute or something to break up your sitting, um, those things definitely can help uh, when done properly and breaking up uh, poor uh, postures or or breaking up those bad durations uh, that we can be in. But uh, it's also important to kind of temper our expectations as well with it and understand that you're not going to actually improve your cardiorespiratory. Uh, capacity by moving from different postures or setups uh, or moving from a sit stand desk or standing and sitting. So um, the majority of those improvements are going to happen outside of your time actually working. So uh, in that time after your nine to five, 
that time after uh, is usually the time that you're going to um, see those improvements if you are hoping to get any sort of physical benefits um, or improvements on, on your physical fitness or cardiorespiratory health. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that it's kind of the bad news, I guess, or maybe not as pleasant news that that doesn't come from there, but um, yeah, but that's just something to keep in mind for uh, expectations as well with this uh, kind of thing. But um, yeah, so uh, on to the next point. Uh, so with laptops, um, even though there is less variability with giving laptops out, uh, they still have their own inherent postural issues. Um, so like I mentioned, if you have a, a laptop that is at eye level, oftentimes that means that you're typing at a higher height that is above your elbows and uh, would put your wrists at risk and um, your shoulders um, at increased risk. So uh, even though there is less variability and that in and of itself can help uh, I guess modulate some of the risks in, in some way, just because you don't have as large of extremes, uh, the use of peripheral equipment is still highly recommended. So uh, whether that's using a peripheral mouse um, or specifically using a laptop mount to have your laptop monitor at the proper height, uh, external keyboard, external mouse, uh, those things go a long way uh, and ensure that every component of your laptop is um, at the proper uh, setup. So. Uh, it's a little trickier if you are using your laptop and you are moving around a lot and it is a bit more mobile if you're working at different locations. Um, that may not be as much of the case now with everyone working remotely. So uh, for a lot of people where your primary computer when you're working at home or when you're working uh, at a specific workstation is your laptop, those are definitely things that are important to invest in. Um, so. And uh, yeah, and with sit stand desks, um, they can be one effective way of reducing your sitting duration across a typical workday. Uh, but there are other methods as well that can also be effective. So um, whether it is planning specific uh, or putting alarms on and planning specific time for you to go up and, and get a walk uh, into your day to break up your sitting. Um, getting a water, uh, getting a coffee, anything like that. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do um, in order to reduce your sitting or, or at least break up your sitting, which, which is the most important thing and to improve your circulation uh, in, in all of your extremities as you're working. So um, taking a stretch break. Uh, one of the effective things as well is actually putting uh, physical reminders in, in terms of like using like posters or aids that can kind of uh, prompt you in a way. Uh, so whether it's having a poster with different stretches or uh, just reminding you to get up every certain interval, those things can all help. Um, so it, it is one of the ways that can help, but um, at the same time, one of the things to consider with this at Sandesk is uh, how long you're also standing as well, because there are some negative effects associated with standing for too long. Um, so really using that tool as a means of breaking up your sitting is the most useful way to look at a sit stand desk. Um, and li like I mentioned, you're probably not going to get a lot of physical benefits in terms of improvements, I guess, on your cardiorespiratory health um, just by uh, still doing kind of static work while you're standing versus sitting. So uh, really just looking at it in terms of your circulation and, and trying to get um, out of those long durations while you're sitting is kind of the best way to look at using a sit stand desk. Um, so that, that was mainly it for the first study. Um, so that, that was more of the postural, physical, behavioral kind of things, uh, comparing the past two studies. Um, our second study, we were specifically looking at psychosocial effects um, related to wellness benefits and employment perks. Uh, on burnout and physical discomfort uh, in modern office settings. So uh, this was a pilot study as well. So we hope that more can be built off of this, but um, so I guess specifically with wellness benefits. Um, so wellness benefits, they are often used as a recruitment and retention tool by employers. Uh, so while a variety of wellness programs are often used to uh, impact healthcare expenses at their organizations. So uh, having healthier employees 
has been seen as a priority for many companies. Uh, and uh, the charts here, um, these are numbers comparing 2011 to 2015. Uh, but again, those numbers are expected to be even higher today. But uh, those are trends we were already seeing in, in terms of their implementation and uh, employers valuing uh, incorporating these things uh, into workplaces. And uh, again, this is from 2015 as well. But um, uh, while wellness benefits and employment perks have been growing in popularity, uh, their effectiveness isn't always substantial. So uh, as you can see, the majority of employees perceive their benefits to just be somewhat effective uh, and more found them to be not very effective than very effective as well. So uh, it's not looking too good there uh, in terms of uh, in organization or an employer giving an employee something and it actually having a substantial impact um, in improving their work. Uh, so uh, again, these are numbers from 2015, but fixing this issue has been of interest for a while and um, especially pre-COVID uh, when much of the benefits were related to being at a actual physical workplace. Um, it was a lot easier, uh, but because uh, it, it's easier to implement those things in person. Um, so things like on-site gyms or uh, depending on your company, nap rooms, meditation rooms, uh, those kinds of things, uh, just having different wellness benefits and uh, in our in our example, we're looking at sit stand desks, but uh, all of those things are more in person um, or more easily implementable in person. Uh, so uh, having those things isn't as useful to employees, especially now, um, with a lot of people shifting to work from home. Um, so uh, you'd, you'd imagine that this problem is isn't still uh, or is still kind of persisting. Um, so. It is important, uh, mainly just because finding what actually works for employees and making sure that it is effective is a very dynamic process and something that changes so frequently with time. Uh, but yeah, so you can even see with certain employers, the way they're shifting towards uh, the way they recruit employees as well. Um, so you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of shifts to um, having work-life balance and, and trying to enable employees to um, have more autonomy outside of just in an office. So uh, giving them certain allowances to do certain things, giving them certain perks, uh, some companies giving white, uh, weight loss challenges from home um, for their wellness programs. Uh, so all, all of these things, um, it, it's a very dynamic process uh, when looking at wellness benefits or employment perks. Uh, so, Specifically for our study, we're, we're looking at sit stand desks um, and laptops as well, but uh, sit stand desks are usually given as a wellness benefit while laptops can be given as an employment perk. Um, but the Society of Human Resource Management actually classified sit stand desks specifically as a wellness benefit uh, and mainly used to promote worker health and validate an employee's position or job security. So um, because these aren't, uh, it's more rare to see them being given across the board. Oftentimes when they are given, it's kind of on a one to one person at a time kind of basis. So uh, they can be used uh, to validate an employee's position in that way um, or, or their job security as well, because they are typically costly. Um, so for employees, if you are given a sit stand desk, sometimes it, it is uh, kind of seen as uh, preferential treatment or, um, something to at least make an employee feel that they're appreciated uh, by having it. So, um, <clears throat> so when we're looking at psychosocial risk for our study, we specifically wanted to look at burnout. Um, so burnout uh, as, uh, so it was, it was of interest to us, and this was kind of the functional definition uh, that we found that we found the most useful. So, um, uh, so it was described as uh, an erosion in values, uh, dignity, spirit, and will. Uh, eroding the human soul. Uh, so, and this occurs when job demands exceed the support and resources available to employees. Um, so it is very strong language, but this was kind of what we need to keep in mind when, when we're dealing with issues of workplace burnout. So looking specifically at that relationship between job demands and uh, support and resources uh, that are available to employees. 
So uh, the research for this project had two primary goals. Um, so we wanted to see if certain wellness benefits or perks might have an impact on worker burnout and musculoskeletal discomfort. And we wanted to see if certain work factors or uh, groups of employees had significant differences in their levels of burnout as well. Um, so we actually used the same uh, exact sample of people uh, in the first study. The only real difference is that we gave them an additional questionnaire looking at burnout. So we, <coughs> excuse me, um, we added in the Copenhagen burnout inventory, um, but we, we ran the same procedure really with, with everyone else. And uh, we're still able to look at discomfort and we're still able to look at uh, postural differences using ROSA. Um, so yeah, we, we essentially collect a lot of data at the same time. Um, and wanted to view the psychosocial side as well. So uh, the, the procedures were largely the same. It was mainly just in how we we're analyzing our data to really uh, look at different relationships that we could see and not comparing it to the previous study, but just looking kind of internally. Um, so uh, just an example from the Copenhagen burnout inventory here. Uh, so it's a 29 question questionnaire. And it specifically segments personal work related and client related burnout. Um, so it gives you uh, questions in all of those three domain domains and gives you a score uh, measuring a person's work, uh, personal work related and client related burnout. Um, so um, that was mainly of interest to us. Uh, so, looking at key insights from that study, um, in, in the organization that we were studying, uh, sit stand desks were actually beneficial in reducing burnout in the study. Uh, employees with sit stand desks compared to those who did not have one uh, had a, a perception of increased support and resources uh, they received at work, which allowed them to combat the demands of their jobs better. Um, and then, employees given laptops uh, as an employment perk actually had increases in burnout. Um, so the flexibility afforded to them by the laptops actually is believed to increase their job demands um, to a greater degree than they supported uh, the employee. Uh, and that's mainly just because when they had a laptop, then their workday would become extended. Uh, they would always be accessible. It would be harder for them to actually escape their work as well. Um, so it, it yeah, so it, um, and, and a big thing with that was this wasn't, uh, for the differences in burnout for both of them, it didn't have to do with physical factors. There weren't significant differences uh, between sit-stand desk users and non-sit-stand desk users and laptop users and laptop users uh, to the point where um, you could specifically zero in and say that uh, there was more burnout in laptop users because they had worse physical setups because that wasn't the case and sit and desk users didn't necessarily have uh, better uh, adjustments or, or better um, configurations of their workstation when we use ROSA to, to see that as well. But um, yeah, so uh, uh, when looking at how uh, employees were actually given access to sit stand desks at the organization we were testing with, um, it was usually employees with greater seniority um, or new hires that were given them as perks uh, or even just workers that were prescribed them due to um, uh, discomfort that they, that they were feeling or they may have gotten a doctor's note or something. Um, those ones were left out of the study again just because we uh, tried not to have people specifically that had a musculoskeletal disorder last year, um, but that was just kind of uh, what was going on there. So um, in those cases, their perceptions uh, were that they were given resources or support that could validate their employment as something, uh, again, like a sit-stand desk is fairly costly. But um, so the claim isn't that just administering a sit-stand desk uh, in a vacuum can just reduce burnout, um, but that there are some underlying factors associated with giving someone a sit-stand desk that could affect their burnout levels. So. Uh, and also just anecdotally, um, and from my own experience doing assessments outside of the study, uh, oftentimes when you only give certain people something of value, and that's very visible to everyone else uh, that's around them, you can have that superiority complex and inferiority complex. Um, so superiority complex for the people that have the thing and inferiority for those that don't. 
Um, and employees can compare each other that way and project those feelings through how they feel supported um, in their job. So uh, that could also play a role, but um, again, that's more of just an anecdotal thing. We didn't specifically uh, assess that, but uh, th that could explain it as well. Um, so again, looking through burnout, uh, through that relationship between demands and provide support is the most helpful lens to really approach the problem, we believe. Uh, and the results of our study, along with the review of the literature, have led us to propose a theory around this. So um, our proposed mechanism for why, uh, for what we found that makes up the theory is that administering, uh, the administering of effective benefits or perks can lead to employees feeling more competent, reaffirmed, and appreciated in the work uh, through receiving the necessary support to meet the demands of their jobs. And this could lead to greater satisfaction and security in their jobs. And in turn, this may help to decrease psychosocial stress or burnout and ultimately decrease musculoskeletal disorder risk or RSI risk. And uh, the opposite can also, we also believe can be true uh, where ineffective supports uh, have an opposite effect all the way down the chain. Uh, to actually increase musculoskeletal disorder risk. So um, when looking at each of the individual relationships within that chain, they were supported in the literature, uh, but to our knowledge, the link connecting all four of those areas uh, hasn't necessarily been established. So um, yeah, so job satisfaction and job security weren't explicitly uh, assessed in the study, but again, this is a pilot study and um, we do believe that warrants further investigation. So, uh, again, this is just a, uh, and we're hoping this lays the foundation for future research, but, um, and the application of this. So, uh, when any wellness benefit or perk is given, uh, can we again, just believe that, uh, we should see things through the lens of if the benefit or perk actually increases the demands of the job, uh, more than it provides the, uh, the necessary support to meet the demands of the job. And when these benefits or perks are effective, uh, they can improve employees' feelings of job satisfaction and security, uh, which is believed to potentially have an effect on reducing MSC and uh, RSI risk. So um, again, it, it's not to say that it's a directly proportional thing in terms of you give someone a sit-stand desk and that immediately translates to decreased MSD risk or RSI risk. Uh, just uh, just completely like that across the board. But um, when you are giving effective support, when we're looking at it psychosocially, uh, what does that effective support also represent? And what how, how could that also have effects down the line? Um, so we do believe it does have an effect. Um, ultimately, the biggest thing is that supporting employees uh, can help reduce burnout and then we do know that burnout uh, does play a role in increasing musculoskeletal disorder risk. So that, that's the main thing with that, but um, yes, but yeah, thank you everyone uh, for listening. Uh, I know it's been rambling on for quite a bit, but um, yeah, so these are the two links here for Rosa. If you wanna see the, the tool on uh, OCAL's website or on my abilities um, and my contact information is there as well. So uh, if you do wanna know more about our research or if you do wanna inquire a bit or if something stood out to you and uh, in, in kind of the talking about the literature and you want to see kind of the specific sources, I, I'd be happy to send those along as well. But uh, yeah, thank you. And, uh, okay, that's great, Ronnie. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we do have a couple questions. So I'm going to turn things over to uh, Val, who is going to uh, ask the questions of you. Okay, okay. perfect. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Ronnie. And uh, lots of really interesting information and particularly the uh, understanding the uh, bridge between psychosocial risk and ergonomic risks, um, which is something that uh, we're very conscious of. So the questions that I've written down so far, there are some uh, uh, coming in that I'll go back to, but there's been a number uh, around references for your stats, um, particularly the stat around MSDs being the most costly medical condition in Canada, um, mm -hmm. and whether the references are supplied uh, in the deck or are available, I guess, um, related to that and some of the other stats that you quote. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they aren't in the deck. I do have the sources separately. So uh, if anyone does want those specific references, I, I do have them uh, in a different document as well. So 
uh, if you do want to send me an email uh, right there, then I'd be happy to share those. But um, yeah, sorry that those aren't in the deck. Okay, and then maybe, yeah, your email's right there. That's great. Um, otherwise, we could add a slide to the deck that's posted uh, later, um, yeah, potentially yeah, no as well. So we already have this deck posted on the RSI website, as has been seen in the chat. Okay, uh, there was a question around why was adjustable, why weren't adjustable desks included in Rosa, but I believe that the updated one does include that now? Or no? uh Sorry, do you mean um, adjustable desks in the original ROSA or? I think that was the question because I think it was before you got. So I guess, are they now included in the updated version? Yeah, so th those ones are being implemented in my abilities version uh, oh, of ROSA. Okay. Um, yeah, they've been working directly on that and trying to uh, create those, uh, yeah, those extra criteria to, to better fit uh, modern offices. So it's in progress. Then there was a question about whether the study was would be considered a longitudinal or cross-sectional study. Yes. So uh, they were cross-sectional. Um, so the first study we were looking because there were two different groups of people. Um, so we, we tried to uh, the original study was cross-sectional at its time as well. So uh, we just made a new cross-section, try to as best as we could make the Methods and the parameters as similar and, and the population that we we're using as similar as possible um, and just comparing those two cross sections uh, to see what is different changes and uh, with the second study as well. That was just the single cross section from uh, our present study. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think there was a question around a cost benefit analysis of. Of some of the changes. Um, this question was proposed at 1045, just whether you've done any. And then actually someone from someone posted the Workers Health and Safety Center 2016 case study about the economics of ergonomics. But um, I just wondered if you, uh, to answer the question was, uh, have, was any of the analysis around cost benefit of the improvements? Uh, so, yeah, we didn't uh, do that particularly. Uh, most of what we were doing was just kind of focused around um, seeing those differences and uh yeah because with a lot of this stuff it wasn't necessarily uh, we weren't checking injuries or, or if someone got injured or anything like that it was mainly just discomfort uh, that we were looking at so uh because we didn't uh we excluded right. people that were injured uh we couldn't necessarily say um right. yeah with, with a number value that this is how many people wouldn't get injured uh, everything we're looking at is just kind of on that spectrum of risk Mm -hmm. um, so high to low risk and, and such. But. Uh, there's a question about the, uh, is there a recommended interval of getting up and down or circulation um, related to sit stand or related to the movement? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so naturally, there there aren't specific guidelines, and, and those things are still um, we're still learning a lot more about it. Uh, in general, from my own review of the literature. Uh, what I've seen is you typically see negative effects from sitting after two hours of prolonged sitting in that interval. So uh, after sitting for two hours at a time, that's when you start seeing the negative effects. But uh, with standing, you typically see that after one hour. Um, so uh, what I typically recommend is uh, if you are sitting, try to catch it before that time. Or if you want, like if um, for for people that do uh, are comfortable with implementing uh, more frequent changes and that's fine. I think the, the biggest thing is just kind of being conscious of those intervals and making sure you're not standing for longer than an hour sitting for longer than two hours at a time. Um, however, you want to play with that. It, that can just kind of be up to the person. If someone wants to sit for an hour or sit for 45 minutes or sit for an hour. Um, but there's also individual differences as well and individual. Um, preferences, so, uh, the, the, I get the biggest thing, I guess, is just making sure. To avoid going over two hours, because across the board, those are typically when you see those negative differences uh, in terms of circulation and uh, right. lower back and, and um, all, all those other concerns. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, we may not be able to have all the questions now um, because I see that there are 16 more, uh, but, <laughs> but um, and we do want to have time for Daryl. I guess, are you available to stay a little bit later than 12, Ronnie, if people want to wait and have their questions answered at the end? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or else we can provide them um, 
there was a question about the article being posted uh, when you once it's published. I guess it's, it's been submitted for publication and or uh, what's the timing looking like. So for the psychosocial study on uh, so for anyone that's uh, interested in going to IEA, the International Ergonomic uh, Association Conference, um, that one should be published through that conference. Um, the other study, the original one, we're still in the process of uh, revising it and getting it prepared for publishing. So um, we're, we're still aiming both of those things to get wrapped up pretty quickly. Um, so we're, we're hoping to get that sent off soon, but uh, you should expect to see that. Uh, it's not a great timeline because we're in February, but for sure this year. Um, but yeah. <laughs>